they opened their first Baker's Delight store in Hawthorne, Victoria in 1980. Um, Leslie first started in the uh, hot bread um, uh, sort of area, I guess, when she was studying for a Bachelor of Science at Monash University when she was a young student, where she met her husband, future husband to be Roger, who was a fourth generation baker. Um, and Leslie and Roger, not only uh, have they built an amazing empire, which you'll soon hear about with an annual turnover of half a billion dollars a year across the network, uh, but they also have a strong ethic and ethical and um, character to their business. They donate over $140 million or have donated over $140 million to charities each year, um, including $6.5 million to the Breast Cancer Network of Australia. Leslie's been the recipient of many prestigious awards, including an OAM for her service to charities, sporting organisations and to the business community. Uh, they also have two children. I don't know where you get the time, but they apparently have two children who are continuing in the family tradition. Uh, one's working in Canada, uh, running their international arm. It's called Cobb's Bread. And the other has recently returned to Melbourne and is heading up the marketing team in Australia. So Leslie and Roger, please take the floor. Thanks, Beth. Uh, thank you for that kind introduction. Um, just a, a quick history of Baker's Delight and our connection to Hawthorne. So Hawthorne has much to be proud of and it's not just its football team. So as we know, it is the home of Swinburne. It is also the home of Baker's Delight. We started, as you said, Beth, in May 1980, a small store in Glenferry Road, Hawthorne. And I'm proud to say we are still in Glenferry Road, Hawthorne. This year was to be the year of the big celebrations for our 40th birthday, culminating in <laughs> a conference, a three-day conference on the Gold Coast for all our franchisees, staff, suppliers and friends. Needless to say, that's not going to happen. But um, our bakery, bakery business has grown, survived and prospered. And this has happened because we, Roger and I, had a go. We made mistakes, hopefully learnt from them, we worked hard, but we were blessed with big doses of good luck. So we started in 1980 and by 1987, um, we had 15 bakeries and a very willing bank manager to lend us money. But we found with each successive bakery that we opened, things weren't quite as good. Bread quality wasn't as good, service wasn't as good, standards was, weren't as good, and needless to say, the profits weren't as good. As luck would have it, during the 70s and 80s, the big franchises, the big American franchises, think Kentucky Fried Chicken, which later morphed into KFC, think um, McDonald's, think Pizza Hut, were taking hold, uh, taking hold in Australia. And they seemed, from our perspective, to be able to expand and expand quickly without um, dropping standards. And they operated on a franchise model. Now, our, our offering was obviously very different to their offering, but we thought the way of doing business of franchising um, could have some benefit. So I'll hand it over to you, Roger, because you were the one who really drove this. Well, yeah, we were lucky. Uh, and Leslie's already mentioned luck. Luck comes into our story very frequently. Um, but we moved to California in late 87, opened a couple of bakeries there. One of them was in a place called Alameda uh, in the East Bay. And the other one was in Marin County in a place called Puerto Madeira. Alameda was still born. Um, it didn't really go anywhere and we closed after a few months. The Puerto Madeira one went pretty well. <laughs> but one of the good things we discovered in Alameda was a little dry cleaning business called Dry Clean USA. And I got to talk to the franchisee there early in the year. And he said he was part of a group with maybe a hundred stores. By the end of that year, they had a thousand stores across America. So that gave us the inspiration to, uh, along with what Les just mentioned, Kentucky Pride and McDonald's, to come back to Australia and convert our existing stores to franchises. So we had 15 managers who we were very happy with at that time, but we said, let's convert them to franchisees. So they started paying royalties and paid a monthly, what we called a business lease uh, for each bakery. Each of those bakeries increased their turnover by about 30% in the space of three months. So it just showed us the value of ownership and people mm. going that extra kilometre. 
they were all very dedicated managers, but when it came to have skin in the game and a bit more incentive, suddenly miracles happened. So with that miracle of the 30% increase, uh, we had their friends and relatives knocking on the door saying, can I have one of those bakeries? The lawyers and bank managers yeah, too? Yeah, so, and the fire took off and uh, through 80, late 89 and then the early 90s, we just couldn't keep up mm. with demand. And then some of our existing people in Victoria said, can I open in Adelaide, can I open in Sydney? And, and we spread across the country with no business plan. <laughs> what you said, we could expand across Australia because our franchise model worked. It was profitable, it was simple and replicable. And Aussies love their fresh bread and love their sweet and savoury treats. By the late 90s, we were across all of Australia, so New Zealand beckoned. And like many Australian businesses, we thought this, the New Zealanders were actually Australians with a, a bit of a different accent. Um, we learnt the hard way. It wasn't the case at all. We made, a few mis we made quite a few mistakes, but fortunately we learnt, we persevered and we're still there. The next expansion was in 2003 and we went to Canada. And we were determined not to make those New Zealand mistakes and we didn't, fortunately. But we made a heap of other ones. We right? made, yeah, we made well, new mistakes. That's one of our acquired skills, yeah, making mistakes. mistakes. But fortunately, we learned from them and we persevered. Canada is really kicking goals now. We have nearly 130 bakeries across six provinces. And we are poised for further growth once this COVID crisis has passed and the building sector can reopen. We also opened a bakery in the US, in Connecticut, which is about an hour's drive north of New York City. And that is trading well. And again, when the building sector reopens, we will be doubling our size there and opening another bakery in the very near future. But really, Baker's Delight is a relative newcomer compared to Swinburne, which has been in existence for over 100 years. But like Swinburne, we have had to adapt to changing environments. And also like Swinburne, we have not strayed from our core business. Swinburne provides excellent education. It did that when it first opened in 1908. It's still doing that. And we, yes, it's very, very different now to uh, 2020 to 1908, but they still provide, Swinburne is still providing great education. We have adapted to change, retail changes, but we have stuck to our true core business. And that is baking bread and sweet and savoury treats using time-honoured traditions from raw ingredients at each and every bakery, each and every day. And I think that's one of our key success factors is the fact that we have stayed true to our core as well as another key success factor is that we've been able to adapt to changing retail environment. Roger, have you got any, yeah, any think further? I to that, okay. there's constant innovation, constant improvement. Yes. That we've been committed to that for at least 30 years. You say, is there a better way of doing I'd all the little tiny things? i Well, maybe 40 <laughs> years. Uh, but it's something we're always looking for, to tweak the recipes, to change the recipes. We've got new hot cross bun, uh, recipes we try every year. Our test bakers will be testing in the next few weeks for next year's Easter yeah. campaign. So it's constant all the time. But there's another aspect I'd like to talk about and introduce another Swinburne, not another university, but the Swinburne I'm talking about is Lynn Swinburne, who is married to a descendant of George and Ethel. Uh, but that's not why I want to talk, talk okay. to you about it. She is also the founder of the Breast Cancer Network which was founded in 1998, and we um, joined up with her in early 2000 to become a founding partner. And we have since then supported the Breast Cancer Network every year, and we've been running annual um, Pink Bun campaigns, which raised one and a half to $2 million each year. And so over the course of the journey, we've raised about 20 million uh, in support of the Breast Cancer Network. But more importantly, all of our bakeries really give back to the community. It was mentioned in the introduction, we give the end of day waste to local charities. Uh, 
all of our bakeries are encouraged to be involved in part of their local community by supporting sporting clubs, schools, you name it, whatever it is to be part of that community and support the community. So it's another leg of our... Another piece of oh, oh, very much so. If we're not part of the community, we really well, don't have much future. Yeah, it's the belief and that... And as the sign says behind it, <laughs> local, uh, yes. it's not a message we promote as much on the signage anymore. If you look at the original photo of the latest Bag to Light uh, uh, in incarnation <laughs> at Hawthorne, Hawthorn, yeah. there's no mention of being local baker because we don't need to tell that story. It is what we are, uh, that one, grammatically. Uh, yeah, it is work. what we are. Uh, we are it. <laughs> Over to you. So another key success factor um, is that we have always run our business with the main focus being on the success and the financial health of our franchisees. So that's the way we function. Franchisees first, franchisor second. Our business dealings with our franchisees and our interactions with our suppliers and service providers are based on trust and honesty. It might sound a bit old fashioned, but not only is it the right way to conduct, bis conduct a business, it works. So we are a family business, the Gillespie family, as the franchisor, and for the most part, our franchisees run their business as a family. And it is interesting that our major suppliers are also family businesses. Further to that, as Beth mentioned earlier, our children, Aaron and Elise, have grown up in the business. They have made their commitment to our business and are now the leaders. Aaron is based in Vancouver, Canada, and he heads up Canada and the US. Elise, along with her husband, David Christie, oversee Australia and New Zealand. We are Roger and I are thrilled that they have stepped into these leadership roles. It ensures longevity. They have the energy of youth and the business will continue to grow and prosper. Roger, anything yeah. more? Well, it's certainly been tested this last six weeks yep. since COVID has hit. And their leadership skills have really come to the fore. We're very proud of the way they've handled it. We've had incredible feedback from our franchisee network, as well as their key uh, reports in both Canada and Australia. So it's been fantastic transition. And this has really consolidated their leadership period and sort of starting a new chapter. It'll be almost... Um, Post-COVID. Yeah, or BC. Yeah. And, uh, AC, yes. before COVID and after COVID. Uh, so we're yeah. keen to see them grow and prosper, which they're already doing, and it's fantastic. So times, speaking of COVID, times and circumstances have changed, and COVID-19 has certainly caused, as we all know, some seismic shifts. Um, I mentioned, like before, and luck has been with us in this, these COVID times. For the most part, we have been able to trade and for most part, our franchisees, their teams and customers have adapted brilliantly to the new rules. But there have been some excellent retailers which have not survived this shutdown. Government JobKeeper and the like may help some, but many more will succumb. It's not a pretty picture. Luck was not with us in New Zealand. We were forced to close on the 25th of March and we were allowed to reopen, but only for click and collect the 27th of April. Needless to say, this small crumb will certainly not pay the bills for our New Zealand franchisees. Our survival there is tenuous. Interestingly, the New Zealand COVID results seem to indicate that the far more stringent uh, regime has not saved more lives, nor saved more infections compared to Australia. However, luck was with us in Canada and US and we were able to trade and we've been trading well. We did have the Connecticut bakery closed for a week or so and we've got one in Vancouver currently closed because they had a staff member who was thought to be uh, infected but it turned out to be a false alarm. But so uh, they're closed, I think, to reopen The reopening tomorrow. soon. Yeah. So we at Baker's Delight look to the future positively. Luck again, Australia is a lucky country and we are certainly fortunate to be living here. Australia was built on an entrepreneurial spirit and this spirit, I believe, continues to thrive. I am confident Baker's Delight will continue to be part of the retail landscape. We produce and sell bread. 
It's pretty basic. We have adapted to changing times throughout our 40 year history. And I think we will continue, not I think, I am certain we will continue to do this over the next 40 years and more and stay true to our core. As we mentioned earlier, our children are firmly planted in their roles and are doing a fantastic job. Their depth of knowledge of the business and their leadership skills and, our com and their commitment to our franchisees has certainly enabled us to survive through this COVID crisis. Roger, do you want to add any closing remarks? Well, my closing remarks really are that we can't be sure about the future. future. Well, I'm pretty sure the sun will come up tomorrow, whether we'll <laughs> see it or not, well, time will tell. And I'm pretty sure it'll come up the day after and many days after that. But beyond that, everything's uncertain. I sort of laughed to myself at times in these last few weeks where people are saying, in these uncertain times, well, I've been around a while and I'm not sure when the times were certain, no. uh, other than the sun rising, death and taxes being the other two things that happened. Well, yeah. Things. yeah. But I'm very, very confident that Backstop will be around for decades to come because of what Liz has just mentioned. And we're very excited about the future. And if anyone watching this is interested in becoming a franchisee, we're happy to talk to you. Just go to the website or yeah. just contact us through Swinburne. Yeah. yeah. So now we're on to the more exciting part. This part's been a bit boring for me because I've heard the story before. But <laughs> the, these question and answer sessions are the parts that... Um, interests me more than anything. So Beth, um, over to you. Shoot away. Great. Fantastic. Thank you very much for that. Now, um, people, if you want to um, ask a question, um, you can put your hand up. There should be a little green button down the bottom. Uh, or otherwise, click on Q&A down the bottom and write um, a question up. Um, I might just start off with a question uh, you know, from myself. Um, Roger, you, you mentioned um, how important innovation and continuous improvement was. Um, how, for you, how risky was that? Um, and what did you do to mitigate the risk? And, and was it, um, you know, uh, did it fail often? Uh, well, the failures happen in the test bakeries or in the bakeries that uh, trial new products. So you have to have a bit of a spirit of adventure. And if... Uh, a particular baker or one of our test bakers invents a new product and we trial it in the market. It doesn't work, it's no big deal. One of our big mistakes a few years ago, we've been doing these pink buns as we mentioned, but we thought we'd go for some pink tarts, oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> jam tarts. Don't talk about the law. And uh, you're gonna have to make them in advance, whereas most of our products we make on demand, not on demand, but we dig tomorrow's okay. demand today and then make it tomorrow uh, for that day. With these pink tarts, we made, I don't know how many million of them for a pink bun campaign, and the flavour wasn't right, and they were monumental flops, so we threw hundreds of thousands of dollars worth mm -hmm. of these pink tarts into the tip. Live and learn. Yeah, <laughs> but, so those things happen, but the, that's probably the worst thing I can remember in the over the 40 years. So the innovations are, are small. Yeah. Um, right. That we innovated by going to Canada, and that cost quite a few million dollars to start with and we lost money there for the first Innovated by becoming a yeah. franchise, yeah. a franchise operation. Six or seven years. Anyway, we've got our money back and it's all, all right. we're lucky because we're a family business. We can think long term. If we're a public company, it would be a different mm. kettle of fish. So I've got a question here from Dibba, your former employee Dibba. from the Hawthorne store. Yeah. And he said, it's it a he or a she, sorry. Uh, what kept both of you going in times when you made mistakes and things may have looked grim? Um, what kept it going with our, our, our staff and, our, and then our franchisees and, and the belief that we were making uh, not only a, great, a good product, it was a great product and uh, people were enjoying it. Um, it. That's what you just put one foot in front of the other. Um, it's, we don't have big highs and we don't have big lows um, in the retail, as many retailers do. And there's the old, many retailers make, make their yearly profit in December. It's not like that for us. We're very, very even, although we, we have just come out of our busiest time, which is Easter. Love Easter. Mm. All the hot cross buns. Um, but you very do. Different Easter, very different Easter. Very different Easter. So you just, 
you, you, what can you do? You just keep going forward and look, well, for, look for the positives. Yeah, it's persistence uh, is the big thing. But there's been many a time <clears throat> where I've gone home. I said, to "Oh yes." <laughs> if the man turned up and picked today, I would have taken it. Uh, but luckily, on those down days, the man wasn't there with, with the check, check, so I didn't take it. Um, but you can't have every day perfectly, but you do have to believe in the long term and believe that your persistence will pay off. Uh, and that's been the thing that's carried us through. And presumably, um, you, your uh, bank manager has to believe in you too. Yeah. So, oh, it's, so it was, a, was there a lot of skill in convincing the bank to keep your overdraft? I don't know what financial arrangements you have, but to keep your overdraft current? Can I answer? Yeah. I do not like debt. Although okay. In yeah. the early days, we, it was a, a necessary um, evil. When we expanded by franchising, we were using the franchise, I mean, we weren't using the franchisees, it was their money setting up the businesses. So for many, many years, Beth, we have been debt free and I love it. Right. And when this COVID-19 hit two months ago, we were fully prepared to have no income for up to six months because that right. could have worse you know we could have been shut down but we still have rent to pay and other overheads and want to keep our good staff and we had the resources to do that if need be but we haven't needed to so again we're lucky so on a related question amita zanega asked did you ever use venture capital no no, no. no, no, no. Uh, having said that in the early days we set up a thing called the oh. vegas delight trust and this might horrify some of you who are borrowing money at two or three percent. But back in uh, what was that early, yeah, around the time of the last recession, 91, 92, mm. uh, we raised a fund of $10 million, which is probably 30 to 40 million today, and used that money to lend to new franchisees who didn't have any money to open a bakery. Oh, oh, they had, yeah. Young and hungry. Young and hungry. And I'd say. <laughs> That's ageist. Yeah. Well, but, you know, we're allowed to be ageist because they're, well, they're, <laughs> they're, um, they're, they're business operators. Business so. partners. Now, I'd say to people, you've got to be that, that enthusiastic about this business. You've got to walk through a brick wall to get here to talk to us. Then you've got to crawl across broken glass. Then we'll talk to you mm -hmm. uh, after you've wiped, wiped the blood off your hands and knees. <laughs> uh, but we would then lend the money and listen to this next bit because this will horrify some at not 10% interest, not 20% interest, 30% interest. Mm. This was then the banks were lending money for home loans for 20 to 21% interest mm. in the it, early it 90s. It was a different, different. Yeah, yeah and it was. All that, we didn't lose money on any of those loans. The people paid them back after 12 or 18 months by being able to go to the bank and get refinanced and uh, pay it back. And we'd roll over the, the fund every two or three years and then we wound it up because it became redundant because the banks are yeah. earning money. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that was the only thing close kind to venture, venture capital. capital. So Edward uh, Boyo Patty um, has asked, what was your biggest headache in your business growth? Getting bakers. <laughs> Getting <laughs> bakers. Yeah, fair enough. They've got to get up very early in the morning, don't they? Yeah. And what's the That's current right. biggest headache? Getting, Getting bakers. bakers. Right. I mean, I'm, that, that's very, and very flippant. No, yeah. But it's getting good staff and keeping good staff. Yeah. 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 Um, so, um, John Dean asks, uh, great presentation, thank you. Wondering if you could talk a bit more about the move to California. Was it just a break and you intended to come back or what was the motivation? Uh, we just wanted to change. We had two young kids. They were five and seven or six and eight or yeah, something, something at the like time. Uh, and a friend of ours had fallen in love with an American and liked this part of California and convinced us that bakeries would go okay there. Why don't you come over and have a go? So we went. And, and I, it, it was fairly open-ended. We, we planned to go for a year and then a six. Yeah. And then mm. we and said, no, we'd rather be back in Australia. Yeah, we saw mm. more potential immediately back here. Yeah. Did you have businesses here when you left? Yeah, yeah. had 15 bakeries here. And we oh, left. okay. So you're managing them remotely as yeah. well. Yeah. You're all risk takers, weren't you? Yeah. Now, Verena Ingbath says, hello, Leslie and Roger. I assume she's a friend. Who, who was it? Verena Ingbath. Okay. Hi. Hi. Uh, 
Now, okay, Bambi Price have asked, has asked, <laughs> what do you see as a long-term uh, outlook for retail? Uh, people like to go shopping. People like the yeah. community feel of it. People tend, people like to buy food, especially from a purveyor of fine food. Um, I think I can't see everything going online. There'll be certain things that will go online, but there'll be certain things that will, will not go online. So for, for a baker's delight and food retailing, I see a bright future. That said, we certainly are working digitally to enable people to either click and collect at our stores and or get it home delivered. But you know, it's, it's, small part. it's a very it's 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 there it's a small part and i must admit it, it's been taken up far more in canada especially in the uh covid crisis recently but it'll be interesting to see how much it drops off after but it's still a part and we're certainly working to help our customers get fresh bread on their table yeah. i earlier today went down to the local uh, Kathmandu in campwell to mm. buy a, a polo and I walked in and I did my, made my choice and I said to the lady, have you been busy? She said, oh, we just opened a couple of days ago and we've been surprisingly busy. Mm. Burke Road wasn't busy when I walked up there. It's been busier than it had been. But she said, people just are starved for their retail therapy. They just <laughs> yeah. get out and... Yeah, and, and, yeah, and touch and see things. So yeah. it's sort of that reinforced what Leslie said. I, I think people still want to get out and... There's nothing beats touching, seeing, smelling, tasting uh, products that you may want to buy. Okay, so Tom Sperling's asked, what were the mistakes that you made in New Zealand? Well, it all stemmed from the fact that we thought that New Zealand would be the same as Australia and we would just go there and open up a bakery and people would flock to it. Um, and New Zealanders would love us. Uh, and extend from that. So we made mistakes by going into high rent shopping centres where we do well here in Australia because we have the turnover. Um, we, yeah, we went, made a mistake in high rent shopping centres and also in the wrong areas. Um, we initially hired to hired the, the not right staff to lead the business, um, and that certainly didn't help. Uh, I think the, the other list was, keeps going on. Yeah, we didn't insist on high enough quality. Yeah. Uh, and it was sort of left to its own a little bit. Um, yep. And as, as I said, the, maybe the wrong hires of country managers. Um, yeah, it's been a, an interesting challenge yeah. there. But misunderstanding the culture was the biggest yeah. one. Yeah. And, it, and everything, everything yeah. kind of cascaded from yeah. misunderstanding the culture. Yeah. So another question from Verena, what do you think will be the big changes you need to make post COVID? Um, Good question. Uh, yeah. Maybe Verena's got the answer. <laughs> We've been trading more or less quite, yeah. quite, except for uh, the bakeries, which are in CBD or very big shopping centers that people have not been going to. We've been trading well in this crisis. Yeah. We've put up um, perspex screens. Many of the stores, it's it's cashless. Um, yeah, one half So we've done the, the appropriate mm. social distancing and and you know appropriate cleaning counter and sanitising hand as hands. Everyone wears gloves. So, mm. so you know we've adapted to the rules. Um, I suppose post COVID, we will adapt to the new rules, which hopefully won't be quite so stringent. We can have a shop full of customers enjoying the yeah. smell. And maybe different marketing. Yes. No need to go back to market with different products or different yep. ways of things or reassuring the public that yep. we're, we're here and open. And because, um, as I said, some of the stores have been hit hard, like Doncaster Shopping Town, the big centres. Mm. Cadston's been closed for three or four weeks, mm. hopefully reopening there next week. Uh, there's a few in Sydney that have, uh, on really? the verge of closing, been hit hard. Uh, but by and large, we're, we've done really well and we can't see that changing other than the likes of Chadston reopening and uh, hopefully... Things are getting better. Back to where they were, mm. yeah. Because 
<clears throat> it's really reinforced the quality of our business in the eyes of our franchisees to say, wow, you know, that they've got a friend who's got a cafe, they're closed. They've got a friend who's got a restaurant, restaurant's closed. People are on the car yard mm. closed. And yet they're trading and trading strongly. So they say, well, I'd better recommit. We had a franchisee in Sydney who was going to sell it, been with us for 20 years. So it just lost his way and just wasn't motivated. Lost his mojo. Lost his mojo, yeah. And now he's discovered it again. And he wants to not just not sell, he wants to get another one, a second one, in addition to the one he's got. So it's very positive and very energised mm -hmm. network right now relative to the rest of the market. Yeah. Again, so just, we're lucky. <laughs> Keep saying. Just, just on that quality issue, I've got a comment here from Federico Bigoni. Um, he says, he's from Italy, okay, so... And he says, well, what were things like when you started in the 80s? Were there few bakeries or were they a quality? Um, and so he just comments that in Italy, there's a bakery every 50 yards. So what was your yeah. secret? Because, I, I, I mean, just for context, you're not the cheapest hot bread kitchen in, in the shopping strip, obviously. Yeah. You're, you've okay. gone for a different first, niche. We, I'll yeah. just answer that. First, first off, we, we aim for the family. So we're not the Laurent or, you know, Philippa's bread that it's $10 a loaf, um, but we're not the cheapest. So interestingly, the history of hot bread shops in Australia started in the six, really in the 70s it started. And that was a result of a couple of things. One, the big post-war migration um, post Second World War migration from from people in in Eastern and Western Europe, they 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 certainly didn't want the way bread the way the Aussies had it. They wanted their bread, you know, light and fluffy or crusty, or if you're, you know, seedy, dark and what have you. And so there was a, a market for different types of bread, and there was also a law. Can you believe this? There was a law that prohibited big bakeries baking bread on a Saturday or Sunday. <laughs> yes, I'd laugh. 1980. No, 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 in the 60s and 70s. Oh, 60s and 70s. So this was this law, and I wonder who pushed it through. Anyway, it was a law, <laughs> but it, it was created a niche, which meant that if you, mm. and they measured bakeries by how many bakers were employed there. So it created a niche for small bakeries uh. to operate, um, uh, you know, operate open on Saturday and Sunday and sell bread. So Baker's Delight in 1980 evolved from the hot bread shop phenomena, phenomenon in the 70s. To get around and, the regulation. Well, it wasn't. A, it was a law. So, yeah, it was. Oh, a, yeah. So when I remember when we first opened, we would do two thirds to three quarters of our weekly sales on Saturday and Sunday morning. Like we were so busy and we used to joke saying, yeah. oh, wouldn't it be great just to be able to open the business Saturday and Sunday and make a living? Um, but there you go. So, uh, mm -hmm. that, so that is how mm. we have evolved. And there was another restriction oh, that more. called the 30 mile limit, which prohibited big plant bakeries from delivering bread more than 30 miles. Mm -hmm. I remember that one. Mm. From where it was manufactured. So that favoured the small, small bakers and the country bakers. Yeah. All right, another, we've got quite a few questions. So there's another one from Manila Bonilla. Ma Manila Bonilla. I understand that there have been differences in lifestyles, preferences, tastes, trends, et cetera, between the US and Australia. Mm -hmm. uh, how are you able to bridge that gap and pivot your business to meet the demand of your customers but still maintain the Baker's Delight vision? Well, the, the, ex the expansion came to Canada first. And that is far more like, even though they sound American, they are very proud to be part of the you British know, Commonwealth. British Commonwealth. Mm -hmm. um, and they have shopping habits far closer to Australian shopping habits. So we went there first. We certainly did change our recipes. We, our biggest seller in Canada is a, uh, it's called the Sticky Cinnamon Bun which is just basically, you know, That's fat and sugar. sugar and a little <laughs> bit of flour. But Canadians love it, and so do Americans. So we, were, we, we still sell our basic range, but we've tweaked it. So when we went in 2015 to Connecticut, um, 
we, 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 it was exactly like the bakeries in Toronto, which is what only an hour's flight from, yeah. from New York. Mm. So that is how we, we, and we have a very big recipe book. So even within one country or one city, you will find franchisees adapt to mm. what their local customers want. So what um, a bakery in, say, a very, very busy one, think of Wynyard Ramp in Sydney, it's, it's right in the Wynyard uh, station, his percentages of what he sells are very different to if you're in suburbia, you know, say Chadston, where people, it's it, the, usually the mum, but not always, going in and buying, you know, bread for the family. So they've got the franchisees do have a huge uh, flexibility in what they make and how much what they make. I hope that, can I answer the question? Yeah, yeah. but if, if uh, as happens regularly, people from Australia visit Canada and they go into one of our shops and even though it's got a different name in the front, they'll get quite upset and say, this is just a rip off of Baker's Delight. <laughs> And they come from Canada if the bag is light and say, this is a rip-off of Cobb's bread. <laughs> uh, and it's, uh, it's the same parents, just yeah. different siblings. Yeah, um, yeah. And yeah. So same the, family. Yeah, you can see we're all the same yeah. family. Yeah. Yeah. So, 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 so related to that, Hiba Maleb has asked, in managing so many franchisees worldwide, what steps do you take to ensure consistent quality of products and services? Oh, there's, there's a lot, lot of steps. steps. <laughs> So we have quite. Starts have, with training. We get training, and we have support, um, area support, at regional managers, and and support people helping them. We have, we have five star assessors that go and and assess the bakery on quality, cleanliness, mm -hmm. what have you. Um, we have regular bread shows. Well, we used to have regular bread shows, not you know with current COVID uh, restrictions. Uh, we have. Um, Obviously, as Roger said, we have a huge online training where our, our, our chief technical bakers will go through how to make the perfect loaf of bread. If we've got a new product, how to make the new product. It is constant. Is this training after they've done a trade certificate yes. or before or during? or Constant training. Constant. Right. Right. Experiences and your journeyman and, and, and the boss and everyone. Everyone. Const yeah. Constant training. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so um, David Knowles has asked, um, Baker's Delight's been a shining light in the franchise sector in Australia since it first began. Oh, thank you, David. <laughs> Many other franchise operators haven't been able to replicate your success. In your, in your view, what are most of them getting wrong? I think not focusing on the profitability and success of the franchisees. Okay. Right, uh, that's the if, main one. That's the main one. Then if you start from that starting point, your franchise selection becomes more critical. Yeah. So if all you want is a body to then get a fee to sell a franchise to someone, you're not as um, selective and not as critical of the person coming in. So we are very, very critical in that early process to say, well, this is a marriage that will last 10 to 30 years. Uh, we want to be serious about the selection process and it's a detailed, relatively long process before they even start training. So. How, ma how, how many do you turn away? What percentage do you... Uh, I don't know. Like, we don't know now. I mean, we let the recruitment... But, but it's, it's obviously significant. Yeah. What's, what is the old marry in haste, repent at leisure? <laughs> yeah. so it, it, but it's got to work for both. Yeah. Um, but the, the key is the focusing on the, the success and financial health of the franchisee. That's just, that is just ingrained in our DNA. Right. Mm. On that, to be a successful overall business, you've got to make sure we're continually innovating, as we said earlier, and look for ways of doing things better. Right now, it's all about Uber Eats delivery and other mm. delivery methods to bridge that gap between the people who want our product but don't want to go don't venturing want to go out because mm -hmm. they're too scared to or whatever. Uh, so it's. Or it's, maybe in legitimate isolation. Well, yeah, mm. but whatever. So they've. You've got to be on the ball to say, well, what are we trying to do as a, a region, whether it be Western Australia is different at different times, mm. uh, Victoria and Victoria is different at Queensland. Uh, so you've got to innovate for each region, but mm. within the, um, family. the family and the overall context and change the marketing. Just, just nothing's cast in stone. 
other than we are bakers who live to delight. So this leads me into another question by Edward Boyat, Boyat Patty. How do you deal with competitors who are trying various strategies to cut you down, such as lowering prices, claiming high quality products when it, presumably they're not, aggressive ethical and unethical marketing, etc.? Or, or maybe trying to infringe on your trademark would be another one. Well, we've or, had a few of those, but they've generally been overseas, so there's not a lot we yeah. can do about that. Um, our biggest competitors are the supermarkets. Um, yep. And they trade, they, they're hard, they're hard, but they do the right thing. Um, and there's room for everyone. Uh, and, and if some, someone opens up down the road who's better than us, we just have to work hard to be better than them. Um, and that's that's just what you have to do. It's, there's, competitive it's, world. it's competitive and there's no, mm. can't be risk free. Uh, mm. And I still remember meeting with Peter King from Mount Waverley yeah. many years ago, visiting Peter, and he said, oh, a, a bakery's open just around, you know, around the corner, five or six doors away. And uh, he said, it's, he said, I've tried really hard, but it's taken the cream off the business. And, and he's, it was really philosophical. And then he said, but I've just got to work hard to get it back. Mm. And that's exactly what he did. Um, mm. It's free enterprise, but it's free enterprise for everyone as well. Yeah. Mm. So here's a difficult one. David Pant has asked, how do you leverage innovation from the skills of your team on the ground? So he's thinking of Zara, which is vertically integrated. It's, a, you know, the fashion store. Yep. They leverage their shop assistants to communicate design changes back to their factory. And that enables them to get a very quick, that fast fashion turnaround. So do you use your people uh, on the ground at the shop floor to oh, absolutely. innovate? Absolutely. Very much In so. fact, some of our best inventions have been from bakers. Yeah. The cheesy might scroll. Our, right. <laughs> I, we still don't know who thought it up, but I, it was a few bakers who wanted to do something a little bit different and the cheesy might scroll yeah. was born. The best ideas, right. the very best ideas come from the network yeah. on how to display bread on, and that then it's filtered up through to our team to make sure it can be replicable yeah. but by and large i'd say 80 percent of the great ideas come from the network yeah. and you just yeah. have to be open to them and do you um uh sort of are you a gatekeeper for that can people do anything or do you have a no. process for filtering those we have a, we have a very strict process for, for filtering them so people can't do anything no. yeah. it, it, well they can but they can't have the baker's delight banner yes. on there yeah <laughs> Uh, so Bill Scales has asked a question about IR in Australia. He said, given the emerging debate about the future IR, what practical changes would you make to the IR system to make it benefit your employee, your franchisees and their employers? Make it simpler. Right. Simplify it. It's so complicated. Yeah, so yeah. many of these cases in you know, prior to COVID-19, you know, all through last year and early this year, where like Woolworths, huge company, Got in the trouble. And Australia, they're lawyers. And the Australian Broadcasting Corporation yeah, got like, it wrong. Because it's so complicated. If you come in the left door instead of the right door, you get paid 20 cents an hour more, and it's just ridiculous. But right. you're working in a restaurant, and you're normally a waiter who only clears the plates from what, versus one who delivers the food to the table. Different award. Uh, right. it's, simplification is the first thing. Uh, okay. Yeah, that's, that's enough. Simplification. Yeah. <laughs> simplification. Great. We have one from Karen Chalmers, um, who said, nice to see you. Uh, many of your stores are so supportive of their communities. How important is this to the success of the business? And is it something you require of your franchisees? Um, it's pivotal to the success of our business. And um, our best franchisees always say yes to community, community giving and community involvement. You, you can't write it in the franchise document. You can't. Well, it's just got to be part of It's got to be part of the culture. Yeah. And, and we're very proud of how our network supports. Like this Easter, I forget how many million buns we gave to hospitals mm. around the country. And it was initiated by some of the franchisees. So mm. I want to deliver a thousand buns to the local hospital and they did. on the Thursday before Easter. And that just happened, you know, spontaneously. And then others heard about it. Oh, that's a good idea. We'll do mm -hmm. it at the local hospital. And it happened all around the country. 
Got a little bit of publicity, but wasn't that wasn't the aim. That wasn't no. the aim. Was so you obviously you're selecting franchisees on the basis of their cultural fit as well as yeah, yeah, very much so. So Amita Zanaga also has got quite a long question. Um, that she, uh, she was the one who asked about venture capital. Mm -hmm. uh, but she says, in your training package for, for franchisees, do you train them to be a backer as well? Um, how much does a typical banker's, a baker's delight franchise make in profit? And how do you compare your franchise against popular franchises? Uh, the first question, I think, backer meant baker. Uh, so we're oh, that, to, uh, yeah, it could be baker. I was thinking yeah. of a financial backer. So. I'm thinking, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. It, it, with regards to financial backers, we don't yeah. encourage people to have partnerships. We have one principal right. franchisee, and they can work for their own company, and we can mm. have a company as well. Uh, so they have to be trained. They have to have their own backing. What was the rest of the question? And their prof profitability. Uh, pro average profitability. Yeah. The profit profitability ranges from zero up to 500,000 a year EBITDA per bank. Mm. Right. Uh, the average is you know, closer to the middle, uh, sort of 150, 200,000 a year, plus wages for the people, um, franchisees working in the bank. Yep, yep. And are you going to tap into the gluten-free market? No, okay. Oh, it's a very no, small it's market. It's a very small market. Oh, really? Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. It sounds, it sounds, in, it, yeah. That, that's yeah. fine. Um, the bread's like rocks to eat. I've tried yeah, it. Yes, <laughs> um, Beth, you poor girl. Um, sorry to hear that. But we, to make gl bread gluten free, yeah. you need a completely sterile environment. So you okay. need a bakery that only makes gluten free products. Yeah. Otherwise, if you are a celiac, um, yeah. you, you will, um, that will be yeah, big trouble. That said, for those who have, you know, what's euphemistically called sensitive tummies, mm. we have developed a loaf called low FODMAP, and that has been a very big, it's got a very nutty taste, mm. and it's been very, very good for people who aren't genetically celiac, but just react badly to bread. Yeah, yeah. And that's been a great seller for us. We developed it with Monash University, um, in port, yep. for mm -hmm. So that's, it's been very, very good. And we'd sell it here and in Canada yep. and I think New Zealand. So that's interesting. You mentioned Monash University. Do you have um, ongoing or irregular collaborations with uh, the research sector or what's the relationship there? That, that's the only one. That's the only one. Yeah. We've got a wheat growing but that's uh, project Monash. at Melbourne University. That's not Monash though. That's yeah. Oh no, any university. Any, any oh, sorry, yeah. sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So you do, you do have ongoing collaborations. Yeah. 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 And, and the, the, do you want to go ahead with the, the Melbourne University one? Very interesting. Uh, well, you can. Oh, yeah. it's, it's developing a um, high a bio fortified wheat, which is high, right. high in uh, iron and high in zinc. Um, and it's and one of the byproducts of that is that it's also uh, the wheat can grow uh, yield, high, yield, yield. high yield in, in, in drought conditions, which, you know, none like this year, but it's most, most of the years in Australia. And it's not only high in iron and zinc, but it's a bioavailable. So when you eat mm. um, bread from this, made from this flour, you can absorb the um, iron and zinc. Fantastic. So they're growing a new cultivars, are they? Yes. Yeah. Which yeah. cultivars? You're going to take a plant breeder right out over it, or no? No, I don't know what we. we it's very <laughs> early days. We're working on that with the university. Oh, yeah. fantastic! Fantastic. Uh, we, John, sorry. We do a lot of research through our millers. Yes. And for instance, right. we developed this barley max product through the CSIRO. Yeah. So we're always looking for ways of, and in Canada we're working on different things as well. So we're always looking for. Way. For new opportunities, yeah. are they uh, are they high risk or, or you know, uh, everything they, incremental? Everything's like, incremental. Yeah, like, if, for instance, we could um, do a whole lot of work like that barley max, and it could have been a real flop. And mm. made it, but that's just a part of that's research and development, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So nothing's uh, nothing's wasted really. And some projects start through our family foundation. Yeah which the Melbourne Wheat Research Project 
started that way, but now it looks like it might morph into a, a, a more of a commercial product with government funding as well through an ARC linkage grant. So it's things that keep us a bit more busy now that we're not running the business. Yeah. yeah. So um, question for another one from Bill Scales. Do you have a systematic documented process of continuous improvement? Or is it just a cultural, a know-how cultural, cultural thing? Yeah. We don't follow an ISO. Right. 9,000, 1,000, whatever the number is, but any of that. No, it's just a, a cultural thing of let's find a better way of doing it. And then we often document things as part of our training manuals. Mm -hmm. So we've got detailed training manuals. Detailed yeah. Manuals yeah. Too. Um, Atifa um, Azhari has asked, uh, you mentioned that franchisees are constantly getting training. Could you talk a bit more about how you are training yourselves to keep ahead of trends and inventions? Uh, reading, um, being peer groups, being part of like the Australian Retail yeah, Association, yeah. Yeah. seeing what universities are doing, CSRO is doing, what our millers are doing with flour. Um, you go so, to conferences and yeah, workshops. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, you're out there circulating basically, yeah, yeah, not, using networks. Uh, the whole, not just what our executive team. Yeah. Executive team. And yeah. are you part of AI group and things like that? No? No. Part of the Franchise Council Australia, 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 um, how do you decide on changes to your products and how, over time, do you see significant changes to your products? Well, we don't do much of that now. It's more your intentions, team. as we've said, from the floor, you know, from yeah. individual bakeries. Some things happen because someone makes a mistake and puts double of something in or half of something in the recipe or under It turns, or it turns out to success. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. And then there's other things like some of our test bakers will go to the International Bakers Conference in Germany that happens every two or three years. Uh, mm. One of our technical bakers won a trip to France in January. Mm. Uh, so they go to these things and just get ideas and, and innovate. We've got a test bakery in Melbourne here at Ashwood and they're forever trialling new recipes, new products, uh, new ideas, um, you name it, uh, right. all the time. So you have a culture of trying things out and going and seeing what other people yeah. are doing. Yeah. Now, I think we're sort of very close to um, winding up. Um, I'm sorry I can't invite you downstairs for drinks as we normally have drinks and, and hors d'oeuvres afterwards. And, I'm, and also, would, when we're back in the world of face-to-face, -face, we will definitely take you out for dinner in, in Glenferry Road, Hawthorne, of course. Oh, um, but thank you Im immensely uh, for your uh, talk today. It's been really rich. And I think the question and answer has been fabulous. It's really when we've really eked out a lot of things that you may take for granted that it's sort of like, you know, really refreshing for us to hear about. It's quite a complicated business, uh, Baker's Delight. It's not just a simple uh, hot bread shop. It's a really big enterprise doing R&D, collaboration, international networking as well as being a multinational enterprise as well and also a little bit of a quite a bit of a risk taker really the stuff you've got going on with Monash and Melbourne. Um, yeah, we haven't even talked about the technology behind it all. Uh, oh yeah. really? Okay yeah. we'll get you back in for another talk about technology. Uh, maybe we'll send someone what else. <laughs> yeah we'll be there. <laughs> okay. okay and can I thank all the participants um, for, for tuning in and thank you for all your questions. I'm sorry I didn't get around to everyone's question. Um, but um, thank you everyone and have a good evening. And next thank you. In, in I think in a couple of weeks we have um, Carissa, the talk we have someone the one of the Clooney's Ross um, award winners coming and speaking about ha uh, pharmaceutical products. Uh, that's, that's correct. Uh, it's Jane Oppenheim from Ego Pharmaceuticals. Um, and she will be talking about uh, their hand sanitizer and the uh, manufacturing of that product uh, here in uh, Brayside, actually, in Victoria. Um, so you might know it as I think, Aquium. 
Um, so there'll be uh, some talks about that and also about the ramp up in production that they're obviously going through at the moment due to COVID-19 and their production of ethanol and uh, how they've been using technology to advance that. So um, uh, everyone will get an inv uh, invite to that. So we look forward and hope you can join us then. Yeah. So we, we lined her up even before COVID-19. How's that? Brilliant. Yeah. Right the curve. <laughs> okay. Thanks again and um, yeah. look forward to seeing you all soon. Okay. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.